Today marks 20 years since the debut of The Batman. You actually have to say the show's title that way, I don't make the rules. I watched that first episode when it came out all those years ago, and I did not envy the creators of this show. They had the unenviable task of being the first Batman cartoon to follow up from the seminal Batman the Animated Series. And ever since that first episode, it has faced comparisons with the shows of the DC Animated Universe. At the time, these comparisons were inescapable because the DC Animated Universe was still on the air in the form of Justice League Unlimited. Another well-regarded show that had the added benefit of fan-pleasing storylines built from over a decade of continuity. The Batman, meanwhile, had a bit of an uphill struggle. I can still very clearly remember the reception this show received when it came out, and the reactions were uneven, to put it mildly. Internet fans complained about the character designs. What was up with the Kung Fu fighting penguin with his Kabuki twin bodyguards? Why didn't the Joker wear his trademark purple suit? Why are Batman's ears so short? And the choice to focus on a more diverse original cast of supporting characters, Ethan Bennett and Ellen Yin, was met with demands for the return of Commissioner Gordon. As different as the show felt, many of its creative team had worked on Batman the Animated Series. Producer Mike Gogan had been a character designer and storyboard artist for BTS. He designed Clayface and storyboarded the famous confrontation in the Galaxy Broadcast Control Room in Feet of Clay Part 2, as well as many other scenes. Executive producer Alan Burnett and producer Glenn Murakami were key figures in the DC Animated Universe. Likewise, several of the writers had worked on DCAU shows, such as Stan Berkowitz, Bob Goodman and, later on, Paul Dini and eventually famed voice director Andrea Romano joined the team as well, so there was some pedigree among the team. And from a technical standpoint, the show was good. By 2004, animation techniques were far more consistent than what we saw in BTAS. This is because they had made the jump to digital media rather than the hand-painted animation cells that were used in the 90s, so there was less room for error. While it is true that nothing in this show comes close to the marvellous technical heights of BTAS, think Mambat's Gotham City Skyline Chase or Clayface's Meltdown, there's nothing as dire as some of the scenes from The Strange Secret of Bruce Wayne, Moon of the Wolf or Be a Clown. One of the things I really want to commend the creative team for is their distinctive character designs. I do have to caveat that statement by saying that I don't really care for Jeff Matsuda's art style, but it is very different to what we'd seen before. The Joker with his massive wild hair clad in a straitjacket with bare feet a kung fu fighting penguin with bold streaks of red hair. Scarface reimagined as Al Pacino's version of the character instead of Al Capone. The fact that it wasn't the same as the DCAU immediately turned some people off, but I'm of the opinion that there's no point in doing the same thing over and over again. Change can be good, even if not every idea is a home run. As for the changes, the most immediately obvious thing to me is that the show's tone was far lighter, and it feels like a step towards what the Warner Brothers executives had always wanted a more child-friendly show. It's important to note that a few years prior to the Batman's debut, there had been a change of management at Warner Brothers, and the new bosses wanted content that would captivate young children, which would mean increased sales of merchandise. As wonderful as the shows of the DCAU had been, they often struggled to build a following with five-year-olds. While this had always been the objective of the network even during the BTAS era, the then executive team led by Gene McCurdy placed story and art above the needs of the marketing department, which is part of why there had been a shake-up in leadership. These new executives were the same people that had polled focus groups about static shock villains and found that the group didn't care for any of them. As a result, they decreed that none of their villains could appear in the show anymore, although there would be some exceptions and entirely indicative of the new regime focusing more on potential revenue rather than prioritising the artist's vision. And the Batman is a product of this regime, but try not to hold it against them. When I think about the character designs, the word that comes to my mind is toyetic, as in they were designed to be action figures. It's why Batman has multiple different variant bat suits. He has his Bane battling armour, the fireproof suit for battling Firefly, and the Arctic suit for battling Mr. Freeze and the Batcave has that distinctive alarm sound whenever a crime takes place, so it can be replicated in toy form. It felt to me like these sections of the episodes were written to appease the toy makers, and that doesn't mean that they're bad. Superman the Animated Series did this from time to time too. Think about his scuba gear or his spacesuit. It was just less frequent. And the executive mandates didn't stop there. DC Comics then-president Paul Levitz had decreed that Batman characters could not appear in more than one show if it could be avoided. This was colloquially referred to as the Bat Embargo. This meant that while Batman could appear in Justice League Unlimited, none of his villains could, potentially for fear of outshining the villain seen in the Batman. 
Ultimately, this didn't really hurt Justice League as they had a wealth of other characters to call on. The Batman was arguably the biggest beneficiary of this policy, with only the Scarecrow, Ra's al Ghul and Two-Face being blocked from appearing thanks to Christopher Nolan's Batman movies that were coming out at the same time. The Mad Hatter was also blocked, presumably because at some point or another he had been considered for one of Nolan's movies. Additionally, they were unable to use Robin while Teen Titans was still on the air, hence why Batgirl was Batman's first sidekick in the show. Levitz's reasoning was that he didn't want audiences to get confused by seeing multiple versions of the same character appearing in different shows, but given how visually distinct from each other Justice League Unlimited and The Batman were, I honestly struggled to see how people could confuse the two. I suspect that this decision came about as an attempt to shield The Batman from unfavourable comparisons, but fans made these comparisons anyway. Where the show did best, I think, is in the writing. While some of the new versions of the villains were a miss for me, I never cared for Goth Riddler or the ice-themed bank robber Mr. Freeze, and try as I might, I could never muster much enthusiasm for original villains like Rumor or Dave. However, Hugo Strange was used really well. Strange became a recurring antagonist that was behind several of the villain's schemes. As the head of Arkham Asylum, he had the means to release the villains and set them off against Batman as a way of studying the criminal mind. He was morally ambiguous, not necessarily outright evil, but genuinely thought that the ends justify the means. And then they locked him up in Arkham. Likewise, their original heroic creations, Ethan Bennett and Ellen Yin, were well-written three-dimensional characters. Bennett was Bruce Wayne's best friend, and while Ellen Yin started out as a Batman skeptic, over time, Batman won her over. And it's a shame that the fanbase rejected these characters back in the day, and they were shuffled out of the show fairly unceremoniously. Despite their strengths, the two have yet to make the leap over to the mainline DC Comics. Perhaps that will change in a few years when the next generation of comic book writers comes up, the people that were children when the Batman was on TV. I can remember a vocal part of the internet fanbase complaining about the insertion of diverse characters at the time, claiming that their inclusion felt forced. But I don't want to suggest that the only reason they stopped being used was because of racists, or that if you didn't enjoy these characters that you are somehow racist. That's not at all what I'm saying. Although it should be noted that all of the racists didn't like them. I think it's fair to say that the team caved to the pressure from a vocal minority of viewers. I don't know who made the call, but ultimately, this backing down hindered the show in my eyes. It's easy for me to say this as a passive observer, rather than being one of the people directly experiencing the pressure. If faced with a similar situation, I like to think I'd stand my ground, but when it comes with the risk of cancellation and hundreds of people losing their jobs, maybe it's better to take a hit for the team. I am also reminded of the current furore around the most recent Batman cartoon, Batman Cape Crusader, with its race and gender swapped characters like the Penguin and Commissioner Gordon. A similar vocal minority demands that original diverse characters be created instead, but when you look at what happened with the Batman, is it any wonder that they hesitate to create new diverse characters? It's kind of sad that the only reason Ethan Bennett is remembered is because he became the show's first Clayface. I liked his story well enough and it was a little tragic, but it felt a bit like BTAS light. The emotional complexity was a bit softer and more easy to digest than the conflicting feelings that the Matt Hagen Clayface instilled in viewers. And I think that was generally true of the show overall. It was less emotionally challenging and more tame than what had come before, although no way near as simplistic as the cartoons of the 70s and the 80s. And that was a very deliberate choice. Why try to compete with the DCAU? They were never going to top it if they tried to do exactly the same thing, so it made sense to try and do their own thing. They may have opened themselves up to criticism, but they were going to face that anyway by virtue of being in BTAS's shadow. I have to say that in more recent years, the show seems to be more fondly remembered, likely as the children that watched it when it first aired entered into adulthood. It isn't quite talked about with the same reverence as the DCAU shows, but I think it should be commended for trying to do something different, for as long as it could anyway. I felt like the gradual erosion of its unique identity, things like the Joker losing his purple straitjacket and moving to a more traditional purple suit, and dropping the mysterious theme tune written by U2's The Edge in favour of a more fast-paced Batman 66-like theme song, made the show feel a bit discordant. Still, The Batman is a worthy show and demonstrably has its own fans. It'll never be my favourite show, but I'm glad that it exists. And hey, if you love it, more power to you. So let's close this video out by saying, Happy Birthday, The Batman. Okay, that's it for this special anniversary video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button, all that YouTube stuff that feeds the gaping more of the YouTube algorithm. If you would like to hear more of my thoughts on the Batman, let me know in the comments below. I have to admit, I don't really care for it that much, but if there's demand for it, I'll give it my best shot. And special thanks to my current channel members who are all listed on the screen right now.
Thanks for watching. Let me know your favourite moments from the show. Could include characters, villains, heroes, or just general episodes in the comments below. Take care. Bye bye.